Numerical Computation, Chapter 9, Video 13. In this video, we will look at numerical methods for systems of ODE. So, first order systems of ODE. So, we consider the following system. X now is a vector that contains n unknowns. It's a column vector. And the derivative of x equals to some vector valued function f, which we write out its component as f1, f2, all the way to fn, a column vector as well. The vector valued function of t and the x vector. And we are given the initial condition. So at t0, an x vector is given as the initial vector. This is a constant vector. So if you feel uncomfortable with all these um, vector notation, then we can write this out as n equations, and they are all coupled with each other. So the first equation for x1 derivative equals to f1, depending on t and all the other axes, and x2 derivative equals to a function f2, depending on t and all the other derivatives, and so on until the last equation, xn derivative. So the good news here is all the methods that we have learned for scalar equation can be quickly adapted for systems. It's almost a straightforward adaptation. So we'll take a look at a couple of examples and see how this can be done. Our first example is on Taylor series method. So here we write out the Taylor series method. It takes the same form as for the scalar equation, except now we put little vector arrows on the x because x becomes an unknown vector. And uh, that's it. That's the Taylor series method for systems. We now go through a concrete example with the functions on the right-hand side and see how this can be worked out. So let's consider this equation, a system of equations. So x1 derivative equals to some function of x1 and x2 and t. And x2 derivative equals to some other function of x1, x2 and t. So we have chosen a linear equation. So these are linear functions of x1 and x2 on the right-hand side. If they were nonlinear, they could be treated in a totally similar way. So in the Taylor series method, we know that the challenge here is to find expressions for the higher order derivatives. Once you found these derivatives, all you needed to do was just plug them in. So let's take a look at how we can get the second derivative of x as a vector, meaning second derivative of x1 and x2. So what you could do is just take in this expression here for x1 prime and differentiate it one more time to get x1 double prime. And then you will get x1 prime, x2 prime, and then you differentiate this in t to get that. Okay? And you do the same thing for this equation for x2, and you differentiate both sides one more time. You'll get x2 prime equals to x1 prime, x2 prime, and you differentiate this in time one more time, and you get this. So when you are doing a program, you actually don't have to plug in the expression for x1 prime and x2 prime. You know they are given here. You could define a variable to denote these two values and compute them once here, and you could use them for this guy, and you could plug these in into these two values and without having to rewrite and write it out what it is. Okay, so hope you see what I mean. And then you could um, combine these and get the um, second order Taylor series method. And if you want to go one order higher, you will need the third derivative. So all you need to do is take in the second derivative equation, differentiate it one more time, you get the third derivative. So you get this second derivative, this second derivative, differentiate this one more time in t, and that's what you get. And the same thing for x2, differentiate this one more time, I get third derivative, 
second, second, and differentiate this, and you get that. And again, these second derivatives are already computed here, which you can use. Okay? And so on and so forth, you can see the pattern. You can go to any order of derivatives as you need it to achieve a higher order Taylor series method. Now, Runge Kutter methods, those we have first order, second order Hohen, and the classic Runge Kutter fourth order, also takes exactly the same form as for scalar equations. So here, um, I wrote it out one more time. As you see, it looks almost the same, except I add many little vector arrows on the term that actually are vectors, just to remind you these are actually vectors. So um, k1 now is a vector, is computed as h times f, capital F. This is a vector-valued function where you plug in tk and xk, which is a vector. Okay, so... Um, and then k2 in the same way, just keep in your mind, this is a vector, this is a vector, and that's a vector value function. And so for k3, that's a vector value function, that's a vector, and that's a vector. And k4, it's a vector value function, takes in a vector and a vector. Beside those little vector arrows, it looks the same. So you could actually think the um, scalar case, the scalar equation, is just a special case of this um, method for vector where all these vectors exactly would have length 1. It becomes one number. Okay? Okay, so here is a practical code, how you can code the runge kutta fourth order method in MATLAB. Okay, so you treat it as a function, it takes in an input value f, your differential equation system, initial time, initial value, and computing time, and its number of steps in time. Okay, and you initialize your time step, the t vector, and s is the length of your x0. So if x0 is a vector, s is not 1, otherwise s will be 1. And then you initialize your x, which is a, a vector of length m plus 1, where each element is again a vector of length s. Okay, and then you initialize it, and then you go through a loop here, computing k1, k2, k3, k4. Keep in mind they are column vectors, so when you call phi val, you send in the corresponding column vector in x. So just be careful, keep in mind, you have to always send them in as the vector and treat them as vector. And then you update the x value, the column vector, at m plus 1 is the previous column vector x, plus this update you do. And then here the k1, k2, k3, k4, they're all column vectors with the same length as the x0. And finally, this is the MATLAB code for the multi-step ABM method, the predictor and the corrector method. So it's also written as a function, takes in AF, your differential equation, initial time, x0, x1, remember it needs two initial starting data, okay, final computing time, and total number of step. Okay, so you comment here and then you initialize and get your h times time step length get your t vector s will be the length of x zero if it's not one this is a vector and initialize your x vector to store the solution put the x zero and x one into the first and second um, column vectors in x and compute also the f the flux function so Fival, this is the most expensive part of the whole program, so make sure you don't call this unnecessarily. Only call it if it's absolutely needed. Okay, And then you go into the loop, time loop. So what you do here, the first two um, line here is the prediction step. You predict a value at the next time step. We call it xs temporally. And then using the an explicit Adam Bashful, 
and then you um, evaluate the flux and store the flux in the, in the variable. So don't do it again, so just store it. And then you go through a corrector step. Okay, so using the information here, mm -hmm, using this f and put it in here to update and get the next x. And then you also want to update the, the um, flux. I would use always two variables to store the flux at this step and the flux at the previous step. So like n minus 1. And then um, you evaluate the flux at n plus 1, the one you just computed, to prepare for the next iteration in the time step. So I um, hope um, this was useful. Um, these codes would be useful for your homework also. So take another look and think about it and look, read each line and understand what the code is doing. And you might use them in the homework. Okay, I hope that was useful and fun. Hope you enjoyed it and see you next time.